Good morning and welcome to this Disruptors session sponsored by Freestyle. I'm Ben Ormsby and I'm the Yorkshire editor of thebusinessdesk.com. Humans are technologists and have been since the dawn of time when our ancestors first created tools out of stone and wood. Um, over the course of this session, and entitled How to Identify Opportunities for Disruption, a, ta uh, a tactical approach, we'll look at how technology is a catalyst for disruption provide information on where to start and look at opportunities for how you can disrupt your industry. The session will be in two parts. So first, let me introduce Richie Brett, the strategy director at Freestyle, and let's get started. Hello, thank you for the intro, Ben. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, so today I want to talk to you a bit about different ways to identify opportunities for dis disruption. This is a massive subject and there's not enough time to go into a massive amount of detail, but hopefully what you get out of today is a really good place to start and something that you can start to think about implementing straight away within your own organizations. So before I begin, just a bit about who, who we are at Freestyle. Freestyle is a digital product studio. We partner with organizations to deliver strategies, products, and services that solve real problems and differentiate organizations' brands. And brands is a really, brand is a really important factor for us. That's because we believe that one size doesn't fit all, and that actually if you're going to disrupt, if you're going to differentiate, it needs to be specific to your brand. And an example of what, what we tend to see on a daily basis is if we went onto any holiday booking site and removed the logo, it would be pretty difficult to sort of remember which, which brand we're, we're associated with. So how do we do this? So we do this really through two lenses. Um, at the start, we're looking to identify problems and challenges. We're looking to explore those problems and challenges from a business point of view. So what does the organization want to achieve? What, the, what does the organization need to deliver? And also the customer and, and customer in the widest sense. So what is the audience needs? And this could be anybody that interacts with a, a product or service. This could be an internal member of staff. Uh, or, or, or a buyer. Uh, and what we're looking for is where those two things overlap. So where can we deliver the best solution for the business and also the customers of, of that business? So on to the subject of today, um, I want to talk obviously about disruption. We've heard a lot already um, this morning about what, what it means and, and how people are approaching this challenge. And I just wanted to start with, with this diagram. Now this is an oversimplification of disruption. There's obviously more factors than, than, than we show here. Uh, one being something that I don't, I don't want to talk about anymore, but we've had a global um, pandemic that's had a massive impact on, on lots of businesses and the way that we deliver services. And also things like government policy, sustainability right now having a huge impact with, with plans uh, at, at a global level affecting many businesses around the globe. But today I want to talk about disruption that is driven by technology competitors and, and customers. The diagram that you can see here is, is intended to communicate what is a bit of a, a disruption flywheel. So we've got the acceleration of technology. Things are changing at a pace that, that, that is increasing on a daily basis. And this is giving rise to a new competitor set. So it's never been easier to compete with incumbent businesses. Um, and the difficulty that we have, um, if we look at it from an incumbent lens is, it, it's not as easy for us to adopt technologies at the same pace or, or new business models necessarily at the same pace as, as startups can. So we're starting to see um, new, new competitors coming into our market and chipping away at our business. And that, that's more the case with, um, larger organizations that are more regulation driven like banking we're seeing that disruption happen sort of like death by a thousand cuts of people coming in and chipping chipping away at that business but technology is is a catalyst for disruption it's not the answer itself but it is allowing that that change of pace and something that we're seeing more of is is this concept here your competitors aren't the usual competitor set and customer expectations are being set by organizations that you wouldn't usually uh, or traditionally see as competitors. And, and the example that we give here is that your customers are comparing Apple to oranges and, and they really are. And if I think about my own experience um, as an Amazon Prime customer, big Amazon fan, um, 
I expect the same level of service now from my GP as I do from, from Amazon Prime. And as a customer, my expectations are getting higher all the time, and they're being driven by competitors that are not necessarily competing on the same market space, which is um, really, really interesting. So Ed from Deloitte mentioned this earlier, and he said it in a far better way than, than I had, have here. And his words were that in order to disrupt, we need to fall in love with problems, not solutions. And that this is kind of what, what I was trying to say here. Um, but if you add the customer lens on this, technology is still just an enabler without understanding what the customer needs or wants how can we deliver disruption the technology has to come later so to frame this discussion i just wanted to use the uh, an adaption of the mckinsey's free horizon model um, the model i think is a fantastic way to help help describe different types of innovation and, and, and disruption and where that sits. I don't think it's necessarily the best delivery model or something that you would use in delivery. When McKinsey launched this, I think year 2000, it had a time element. Um, and, and, and that's something that, that I don't necessarily agree with. You know, there's no reason why we can jump into, in, into a horizon free at any time. There's no, there's no critical path there. So um, this is an adaption from a book called um, Innovation Tournaments, which I really like because it breaks it down into a different way. So if you're not familiar with this model, horizon one innovation is about known and core business. This is the incremental innovation that we're doing on a daily basis, improvements, extensions, um, and, and sort of looking at um, improvements around cost and those types of things. Horizon two is where we start to look at uh, new to us. So this may be borrowing concepts, models, technology from other sectors of industries and applying it to our business to, to, to move forward. And Horizon three is really that um, new to the world, this brand new bleeding edge, new technology um, and new market. So if we take a step back and look at the, the, the axes on here, Horizon one is about um, existing markets. Horizon two is about emerging markets. Horizon three is new. Um, Horizon one tends to look at mature technology. Um, Horizon two, um, emerging technology, and then brand new technology there. Where we see real disruptive innovation tends to be around Horizon, um, between Horizon two and three. So what, what kind of happens? So we need to understand in order to innovate, in order to move towards a, true disruptive innovation, we really need to understand what the customer wants and gain that insight. However, there's, I see a problem with this. Organizations are built um, and structured and measured around today, what, what we're doing right now. And that's, that's right. And that's still critically important. But the way that we tend to use insight methods and the way that we talk to customers tends to be rooted in today and into in today's solutions. What that means is that we have a narrowed view, um, a narrowed scope around how we then step change. How do we do, how do we create that disruptive innovation when our insights are really based on how people are using our, our products and services today? I want to be super clear that stuff is still critically important we still need to be doing that we still need to be moving our existing products and services forward and developing those but it does limit how we then move forward and, and parts of this comes down to the old saying of you know faster horses versus the motor car you know if our focus is on today we're just going to get faster horses so how do we shift and how do we get the types of insight we need to take that leap forward into something that is that is new. So what I want to talk to you about today is a theory called jobs to be done. This was developed and, and there's lots of lots of different sort of ideas around where this first started. It has its roots in the 1960s. Clayton Christensen sort of coined the term jobs to be done and there's various iterations of the method and how it's applied. It was originally born from a marketing point of view. But really what it aims to do is decouple the customer or the user or the stakeholder need from the solution. So jobs to be done is, a, is, is built on the, me the methodology that people hire products and services to achieve something. There's an underlying job that they want to get done, which means that they're choosing a particular solution in order to achieve that. And the example that's thrown around a lot is people don't want a quarter inch drill. 
they want a quarter inch hole. So if we take this approach and move it forward, what, what does it do to that vision of um, the innovation horizon? So if we decouple the need from the solution, it tends to open the field of view. It tends to um, provide more opportunity or increase the opportunities for other stuff that we could do, different ways of doing things. And hopefully this helps explain that a bit better. So if we were to take Flymo as an example, they could see themselves in that traditional Horizon 1 area of we're in the lawnmower business. However, if they were to apply a jobs focus and understanding that actually people don't want a lawnmower, they want a beautiful garden, they want to maintain their garden and expand it down that view, suddenly the solutions that they can develop and the ideas that they can create, the new business models that they can develop it is wider. There's more scope, there's more opportunity um, to look at different ways of achieving that goal. So how do you actually go about doing this? So the way to identify jobs of, of customers, it always starts with, with interviews. So we're talking to people usually for about an hour um, to understand in the context of, 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 of the scope of the work that we're looking at, what, what it means for them, what are their drivers, what's really going on, um, what is it that they're trying to achieve. And those jobs that we identify via those interviews um, tend to be functional or emotional and they can be social as well. So functional, um, I want, um, I, I, you know, I want to tidy up my garden. An, an emotional or social end of that might be so um, my neighbours um, love my garden. <laughs> um, so there's, there's different ways of looking at it. Those jobs also have sort of needs underneath them and there's more detail that you can go into. But one of the benefits of working in this way uh, and a different way to, to more traditional uh, methods of, of gaining that insight by directly asking people about a, a product and services, the insights that you gain tend to have a longer um, life shelf, uh, shelf life. So an example of that is Netflix, right? Netflix have always been serving the same um, job. To, to entertain um, at, at the highest level. The way that they address that then um, has changed. As technology develops, they can keep coming back to that need because that need to a certain degree and, and possibly forever stays the same. They're able to change their approach to how they deliver it. Um, so the example is, you know, when they first started, it's easy to forget they were posting DVDs out to people um, and now everything is streamed and on demand. Now the target and the, the job that they were addressing remained constant. As technology, technology developed, they were able to pivot and, and deliver solutions in new ways. So the way that we would do this is we'd identify an appropriate audience to speak to. We'd speak to usually around 10 people, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the scope of what it is that we're trying to discover and understand. We'll interview those people. We'll, we'll tease out the jobs from them. So we're, we, it, it is very much a discussion. We're not necessarily asking questions. We have a discussion guide, not questions. And we let them lead that conversation. And we're looking for emotional cues. We're looking for highs and lows and um, to understand what's delighted that individual, what's, what they're really passionate about, what they're really trying to, to get done. And then we can end up with, with hundreds of jobs. And what do we do with those? So then we'll take those to a bit of an opportunity analysis. So at this point, we're going out to, with a survey, to a, a statistically significant group um, based on our audience, um, and we're asking them, we're, we're showing them those jobs, and we're asking them how how relevant are these to you? So, do do you have this same need, and and how uh, what is your ability to achieve these right now? And that gives us um, a nice chart that says, you know, here, here's the underserved opportunities, here's some things that are likely to lead to disruptive ideas, here's here's an unmet user need. Um, we then use that and turn that into how might we, so very quick exercise to turn that job into a question. And then we ideate off the back of that question. So we're generating solutions to address those needs, always referring back to the jobs and the supporting needs underneath them to build the best possible solutions. And then it's about placing small bets. So after we've done a bit of prioritization, which takes into account the business need as well. So we're scoring concepts on what we know today. We then spit out a list of, you know, this is what we believe we should tackle first. 
And then we're moving into an experimentation phase. Um, and the reason for that is small bets. So we're not having to invest thousands, millions of pounds into developing new concepts that then launch and, and potentially fail. So we're failing fast, we're failing cheaply, um, but we're gaining insights all the time. That then goes into a cycle and we keep testing until we're confident that we can move to um, delivery and launching new, new disruptive products and services. There's a second part of the conundrum, the problem that we face when we are not only speaking to people in the, the, the known and the core and, and, and around existing products and services, but as I mentioned at the start, we're also structured that way. So it's very difficult for a business that has got targets to meet on its existing products and services to jump into Horizon 2 and Horizon 3. So how how do you make that transition? How do you give that freedom to an organization in order to, to, to create those disruptive services? There's a couple of ways. Um, there wasn't an emoji for a peninsula. There was just an island one, so hence the, the little beach scene. We need to find ways as organizations to create a safe space. We need to be able to create a team um, or, says the guy from the agency, work with partners who can operate outside of our operating system that are not tied in to the same measures, the same policies, the same procedures that we are, that are rightfully in place for today, but perhaps could prevent us getting to the solutions of, of tomorrow. And there's different ways that, that I've seen this done. You could obviously work with a partner like ourselves, or you could do this internally, but you need to give those people the freedom um, and the scope to look at, at, at what's next. And, and why this is a peninsula and not an island is there still needs to be focus and that way that there needs to be connection back into the business. So one way that I've seen this done before is creation of venture teams within organizations that have the uh, permission um, and a small budget to go after new things. The, this team will then um, look at all of the research, do the research, find the jobs, start to create solutions, start to validate those solutions through the lens of first desirability, do people want it? Um, feasibility, can we deliver it? Um, and viability, will, will people pay for it? Once they get it to a certain point, coming back and pitching that into the business with that evidence to get the investment to take that forward into something that can be launched and scaled and disrupt uh, sectors and industries. Um, so that was a very, very quick run through of um, some of the ways that, that we do this. What I would love is if you do have any questions, I know we've got a discussion um, coming up now, but if you do have any questions, please reach out to me and I'll be happy to go into more detail. I can share lists of books that would be a great place to start specifically around jobs to be done um, and, and more tactical guidance on how to run um, uh, those types of uh, programs of work to get the insights that you need to develop the, the new solutions. So I'm going to hand back over to Ben now. There we go. Classic. I, I'm the one who failed to fail to unmute themselves. But no, thanks, Richie. And that certainly provides food for thought. And uh, you know, shows how we've got to change our outlook to be able to truly drive that disruption and innovation. Uh, I'd now like to, well, I was going to say, I'd like to invite I, uh, David Campbell, Director of Shore Screen Diagnostics, and Steve Waller, Head of Marketing from Ticket Factory, to join us. But as if by magic and the joys of technology, they are now on our screen. So this part of the session will be a discussion. If any of the audience have any questions, please use the chat button on the side of your screen, and I'll put them to the panel. But uh, to start with, I'd like to ask you, oh, well, particularly David and Steve, to introduce themselves uh, and Tell us a bit about how they've seen their relationship and the business's relationships change with their customers over the last 18 to 20 months, which, as Richie said, has been uh, a, d a disruptive time. So if we start with Steve first, please. Hi there, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm Steve. So I work for the NEC group. Um, so I'm responsible for the marketing department for the Ticket Factory, uh, Utility Arena in Birmingham and Resorts World Arena. Um, so in very broad terms, my team is responsible for selling tickets um, for events at our arenas, such as Disney on Ice or Stormzy, um, and a number of our third-party clients uh, who we run the ticketing for, such as British Athletics or the RHS. Uh, so there's a real variety there of what we what we do marketing for. 
Um, but yeah, last 18 months, um, been hugely disruptive for the live events industry. Um, so at Utilita Arena, Birmingham Resorts World Arena, uh, our customers dried up overnight, really. Um, our venues, which were once full of 15,000 people, have sat largely empty for the last year and a half. Um, but now they're back to life. That's posed a huge number of challenges. How do we make the event going experience uh, feel as normal as possible whilst doing our best to ensure everyone's safely? Um, so we've introduced COVID status checks as part of our safety measures, and we encourage people to wear masks in our venues. Um, so consequently, we've really ramped up our customer comms um, to put this information in front of people. Um, but as we all know, customers don't always read everything we put in front of them. Um, and some of our customers don't feel like we're doing enough to protect them, whilst others feel like we're doing too much. So it's a really tricky balancing act. Um, but on the whole, our physical measures and our comms have been pretty well received. Um, and we've seen an increase in some of the um, that customer satisfaction scores since reopening, which, which is actually quite surprising to us because we've prepared ourselves for a drop in our satisfaction scores, but actually they've, they've gone up. Um, and then on the ticket factory side, um, we went from selling 2 million, uh, 2 million tickets per year to having to reschedule or refund almost all of those. And that created a huge burden on our contact center um, who saw the inquiry skyrocket. Um, we were one of a very small number of ticket agents who kept our phone lines open, um, but there were times when we were close to being overwhelmed. So again, we worked on our comms, creating FAQs to reduce the need for customers to call us. Um, and one bit of nice innovation that we did was we, uh, we took an existing product that we had that our development team had created in-house uh, for handling registrations for exhibitions and um, conferences. And we repurposed that uh, to handle uh, large volumes of customer inquiries and batch refunds. Um, so, it, I mean, it's really been, you know, we, we've got through the last 18 months by kind of the, the goodwill and the hard work of our, of our people, really. Um, and you know that that's what's kept us going, and you know we we've got out of the other side of it. So things are things are starting to look up again for the live events industry. Thanks, Steve, and and David. Same sort of question to you. You know how how have how have the last 18, 20 months impacted how you communicate and engage in with your with your customers and the relationships you have with them? Yeah, sure. So um, so uh, short screen diagnostics uh, make um. Uh, IVD medical devices, so it's anything that gives you a result in five to ten minutes. Um, we're, we're sort of quite well known for the lateral flow tests uh, that, that we're making at the moment. Um, so yes, I think during the uh, the disruption of the pandemic, um, we've seen trends speed up um, to be you know, decades of change being done in in a matter of weeks. Um, and there's, there's a number of sort of factors which have led to that, but. I think it's um, created a lot of sort of dispersion in many industries where um, the value offered to customers um, has been skipping out the traditional route of distribution. So that might be sort of on the high street with um, people going online um, or cinemas, you know, um, people going for the home streaming option. Uh, and in our industry in healthcare, um, it's really led to um, a lot of the diagnostics and uh, a lot of the healthcare being delivered uh, directly to people's homes rather than going through uh, the sort of traditional GPs and hospital uh, routes, depending on what it is. So uh, from our side, um, we've, we've been looking at how we can um, adapt to that as, as a business. Um, and it's really meant that we've had to uh, use those sort of ideas internally. So, um, you know, office dispersion, we've got more, more people working from home, we're rationalising the, the workplace space and creating collaboration spaces rather than traditional offices. Um, we've been moving uh, to, um, with the customer, uh, rather than having sort of face-to-face -face meetings as, as we would used to do, um, we've moved a lot to video calling, which is actually really revolutionized how we deal with international clients because it's meant that we can give them um, very close support, which which we weren't able to do before. Um, and we're really moving with that um, sort of dispersion movement in healthcare by rather than focusing primarily on the professional users uh, that we have done in the past, we're now moving towards uh, sort of home and, and self-testing. And you know, particularly as people become uh, a lot more used to uh, dealing with products like lateral flow tests 
and that will have to change uh, completely how we uh, communicate and and work with uh, customers going forward. Uh, I guess that that raises an interesting point that you know obviously lateral flow tests 18 20 20 months ago weren't something that any of us would necessarily have thought about you know that, let alone be doing on a fairly regular basis I, I, I hasten, hasten to sort of add but you know how do you go about marketing something so new to an existing customer base when you know they, they might not understand the concept I guess uh, well Richie do you want to chime in on that one first and then we'll go to the other guys as well yeah, I think the biggest change has been the the channel shift, right? L lots of um, lots of channels that we had access to were just switched off overnight. So how do you that? How do you continue to communicate? I think everything everything became a bit transactional in in how we spoke to people, how we dealt with organisations, how we, how we dealt with our colleagues as well. But the, the missing piece is that is that brand piece. How do you how do you ensure the experience still stays high? Um, and that, that customers enjoy it, but also, yeah, how do you how do you communicate something that is is brand new? I guess for the lateral flow test, there wasn't really a choice, um, so it became uh, how, how quickly um, can, can I get these? Where can I get them from? Less about um, do 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 I necessarily want to, want to do them? Do do I need them? Um, unfortunately, lots of us don't have that choice. Uh and I guess then that the bit of that that also rings true. You said it's become more transactional, uh, and actually the the way we communicate has changed. Well, you, and David, you touched on it. Gone were face to face meetings. It was far more online interaction. And yes, we had the joys of Zoom and and virtual conferences and things like this. But we also saw social media boom. I guess what are the challenges? Perhaps Steve, from a, a direct consumer point of view, what are the challenges when you're looking at the latest social social media hotspot? say TikTok taking off over the last 18 months and so how do you look at that and go how can we use that or question whether it's right for your brand do you you know do you have a way of telling a fad from a trend so to speak yeah so I think I mean lots of things probably start life as a, a fad um I think there's a prediction in the 90s from an, an American author that uh, no online database would ever replace your daily newspaper um which is probably just as well for the business desk, that one turned out to be incorrect. <laughs> um, but I think the, the question, the, the answer to that is uh, is probably twofold. Um, you know, I think you need good, picking up on some of the points which you made earlier, I think you need good customer insight um, and, and a solid strategy as, as well. Um, you know, does this thing that's seemingly a fad solve a customer need? Um, and is it gaining momentum with customers or is it fading? You know, those aren't necessarily easy questions to answer. Um, you know, also how can we adapt the key messages in our strategy to embrace that new opportunity? Um, you know, I, I think if, you, if you've got strong key messages in your strategy, they can, you know, they, they can move across different channels and communication methods. Um, but secondly, you need to be willing to take risks and have a tolerance for failure as well. Um, if you snatch your opportunities without putting in a strategic work up front, you'll inevitably end up losing money unless you get very lucky. Um, but I'm not a big believer in innovation through kind of eureka moments. Obviously, those do happen, but I think they tend to come through years of hard work and graft um, to get there. So not sure if that answered your question fully, Ben. It, it, it doesn't, but I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always uh, glad to see it here that we're not talking just eureka moments because I always think those overnight successes. Uh, no one sees how many years of, of, as you say, hard graft go into that overnight success. Um, David, I guess you know what you, you've talked about the, the lateral flow tests and how that you've been quite well known for that, and actually now the, con the changing consumer trend of people understanding how to perhaps do a test at home. You know what. What is that leading you to think about innovation wise, you know, and what new approaches perhaps are you implementing to, to other, other areas of your business? Um, yes, well, um, with, with lateral flow tests, um, you can really adapt the, um, the antibodies on, on the test for many different things. So um, the applications are very wide, but uh, we've not really had the opportunity to uh, go sort of directly to consumer in the same way that we have now because 
uh, there's a lot more um, understanding and, and that feeds into the usability of the devices. So from a regulatory point of view, uh, it makes it easier for us to uh, to move products forward, which is great. So, so um, we're looking at a lot of different parameters uh, that we can use uh, in the lateral flow space and, and really build a platform uh, for uh, sort of home home testing and, and home healthcare. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in uh, the microbiome health at the moment. So we have a, um, you know, a, a gut test, which can be um, uh, sort of correlated quite well with um, one of our sister companies, uh, Neutral Vitality, that make liquid vitamin supplements. We can uh, make uh, pre, pre and probiotics um, according to the, uh, the microbiome health. So um, we're really looking at innovative ways where um, consumers can get more out of their health at home um, before going to the uh, you know the doctors or the hospital. That that's massively interesting to me. So this is the, this whole process of COVID and home testing has opened a window into uh, home diagnostics in a way that that traditionally had barriers because you had to, you know prick your finger or put stools on tests. You know, no one really necessarily wants to go out their way to do that. But there's this really interesting layer that that's then on top of that. Of we've never had access to more information about our health. But we don't know how to interpret that we don't know what to do with it so this idea of actually you know i do a test and then i get personalized supplements recommendations off the back of it is is really exciting because i don't necessarily want to know the detail about why and how and why this is working in my body i just want a solution so the bridging that gap between identifying a problem and then giving me something to fix it in the convenience in a Amazon Prime way of just, you know, it arrives on my doorstep and then the solution arrives on my doorstep X days, hours, minutes later. That is massively exciting for for, for sectors like, like your, your own, David. Well, it, it's fascinating. You, you worded it perfectly there then. It, it does the Amazon thing of personalizing the experience. I guess personalization has been one of those momentum shifts within Martin that's been happening well for at least the last sort of 10, 10 years but you know equally it's gained 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 pace the last maybe couple of years how do you approach that personalized aspect I guess Steve you know again that consumer approach you know you must be having you must have lots of data about all the people who buy their tickets what they're into the sort of shows they like how important is that in ensuring that you know you adapt and that and it fills into that strategy that you talked about earlier yeah, we, we've got lots and lots of data on our customers. So we, we've got a, a database of about two and a half million customers. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people in theory to, to go out there when we're, you know, marketing events. Um, but we'd never communicate the same message to all of those customers. Um, we, we've got a really advanced segmentation model that we use within the NEC group. Um, you know, our database is broken down into seven different groups. Um, and you know, each one of those groups has very different motivations for for attending events. Um, you know, so for example, the ticket uh, we do the ticketing for three uh, three county showground, and you know, some of the people that go there, they they might be families, and the you know they want to know about the um, the opportunities for face painting and banter castles, things like that. Whereas other groups might be an older audience and they want to know about the seating and the, the eating and uh, like the food and drink opportunities there. So all of the marketing we do is, is very, very targeted. Um, and, you know, that is only going to get more and more so over the over the years. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we integrated with a tool that allows us to track everything that people do on our website as well and feed that into our single customer view. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, you know, the, um, what's the phrase that, uh, data is the, the new, the new oil or whatever it is, you know, that is, that is really, really important for the ticket factory and, and really for any, um, you know, B2C organization, getting to know those customers better and serving them, you know, the most relevant content at the right time. Well, it'd be wrong for me not to do a segue that there is a whole session on data later if if you're interested in how that can help fuel your disruption and innovation i guess the the other part that I'm, I'm well i've got to ask one quick question you mentioned stormzy and disney on ice at the start steve how much correlation is there between those two audiences uh very very little oh, um, it must just be me that must just be me <laughs> but uh but anyway um you know as, as we're sort of talking about innovations richie you know you must hear a lot about what businesses are trying to do and 
the, the, the opportunities they see. We talked about the idea there with, that David was talking about in the personalization. What are the other big trends you think we're going to see in innovations? I think if, if we just come back to the, the, the data bit and personalization, there's this interesting piece around privacy. So people are more and more aware of what what and how their data is being used and where, where it's being taken from them. But people are still willing to trade that in, in relation to stuff that is helpful to them. I think the challenge for any business is to take the right data that leads to um, better experiences for their customers, not just information for the business and i think if you can get that balance right i think more people are, are happy to to trade that sort of information as long as it's benefiting them as well and they can understand how it's being used in that way so privacy is massive we're seeing apple do sort of hang their hat on the whole privacy element at the moment and really going down that route um that's just one of thousands of trends that we're seeing in the market at the moment Richie, actually, to keep you here, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, Becky's asked, when approaching jobs to be done work and experimenting on solutions, how do you make sure that you focus on the right problems for maximum impact, for the maximum impact for the business? I think you've got to frame those around, and that's where the lens from the business comes in. So you can you can go down a rabbit hole of what a customer wants, and if that's not delivering for the business, and like, it, it, is it worth doing? Um, so I think you've got to get that balance between the, the what the business needs or what the outcomes the business wants, um, and align that to the customer need as well. And where those two things marry up is hopefully where the disruptive innovation that that, that leads to growth happens. Okay, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do it again. I know we said there's hundreds of trends, but I'm gonna ask each of you to tell me what sort of what trends you think could be could be transformational, perhaps for your business and your sector, as we as we move into 2022 and the rest of the 2020s, which will hopefully be uh, in the wake of COVID, uh, and it will just be a distant memory by the end of the end of the decade. So, David, what is it that you're you're thinking and you're looking at utilizing in, in the business moving forward? Yes, well, um, we sort of touched on it uh, already with the um, the approach to to home healthcare and yeah, of offering uh, more of a personal solution. You know, in in terms of data, we we actually get a huge amount of data from um, clinical samples. You know, if, if that's blood or uh, saliva or, or feces, <laughs> whatever comes through the uh, the door for us for the lab. Um, so it it's really uh, sort of building that platform, and then you know, of course data in that space is, is really important as well because you can then uh, look at sort of preemptive you know even uh, better diagnostics with with um, more data on uh, on those uh, samples so um for, for us yes it's, it's about focusing on uh, on the uh, the outcomes for for the uh, for the patient i suppose and the uh, the value that we can deliver with with quality diagnostics picking up issues early before uh, issues arise same question to you, Steve. Yeah, so for, for us, it's um, it, it's definitely digital ticketing. Um, so a challenge we face in our arenas is, is, is that we don't sell every single ticket. And of the tickets we do sell, we only know the contact details of the lead booker. So there's a huge number of people in our venues that we refer to as ghosts. Um, and there's a massive pot of customer data there, which is currently untapped. So we're in the middle of this digital ticketing project, uh, which will reduce our reliance on paper and PDF tickets uh, and replace it with an app that people use to enter our venues instead. So instead of the lead ticket buyer dishing out tickets like they're playing cards, um, they'll be sharing them via email instead. Um, so all of a sudden we start getting a lot more data and a lot more opportunities to market to those customers. Um, but as, as Richie alluded to there, kind of uh, within the com confines of GDPR, of course, um, you know, making sure we've got that consent. Um, and an app on people's phone gives us good commercial opportunities as well. Um, for instance, as soon as someone scans into the venue, we can be hitting them with a notification saying, have you thought about going and getting a beer? Um, so, yeah, digital ticketing is a, a really big one for us over the next year. Fantastic, and and that's where you'll find that set that segment of people who love Disney on Ice and, and uh, Stormzy together. Uh, Richie, same one to you. I think um, sustainability is is massive right now for for every business, every organisation. It's how 
how do we deliver against that? But how do we communicate what we're doing with that? How do we even understand the problem? It's really complex. Um, and what do we put in place to, to change that? And it, it comes back to this piece again, looking at from a health point of view is there's lots of data out there. What do we do with the data? What's that middleware that gives me the answers, whether that's from my health data, from a sustainability point of view that businesses are gathering, how, how can I use Harness and solutionize that? How can, can somebody give me the answers, please? That's, that's what we need. Fantastic. And I'm gonna use that as my moment to draw it to a close because I think it's clear that data is going to be the uh, is, is going to be the oil and gas of the future. Thank you to everyone who has joined us this session, and uh, thank you to our session sponsor, Freestyle. It certainly feels like it's going to be an exciting time, uh, and if we follow those tips that Richie suggested, we might all be able to be innovators, if not overnight successes, because of the amount of hard graph that goes into those. So thank you very much. Please do stick around because starting uh, shortly will be a session looking at the opportunities being created by advanced connectivity, which will again all feed into that digital uh, and data driven economy moving forward. So thank you very much. And thank you to all our speakers. And I hope you all have a fantastic day. Thank you.